get there two pieces of pizza, hopefully. Good, good. My name is Brad Miller, and I co-lead the Working with AI user group together with Jacob and Manasa here. And we're really excited to have this merger of uh, the data science user group today. And we're excited to have everybody because hopefully we can each contribute towards and support each other in our own uh, use cases, right? Some of us are doing more heavy on the data science side of things. Some of us are doing more heavy on the AI side of things. And others of us are just interested in learning more about all of that. And hopefully what we can do is bring us all together, each contribute in our unique ways, and everybody can learn and grow together. That's the goal of these meetups, of this user group. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself, you can reach out to Matt, you can reach out to Jacob, you can reach out to Manasa, and you can just let us know what you would like to talk about. If you have ideas for future discussions, if you have ideas for something that you would like to present, something that you haven't heard yet that you would like to hear in the future, just let us know so that way we can make sure that we're accommodating everybody's interests, needs, and desires. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a project that I've been working on for a grand total of two weeks. Um, I am teaching a class this semester called Intro to Data Storytelling. And up until a week ago, I didn't realize this, but I didn't have a TA. Now I just got a TA. But I have a friend who is a professor at Manhattan College, and he was telling me all of the struggles that he goes through. He teaches three different classes there at Manhattan College, and he teaches another class at Stevens Institute of Technology. And he doesn't have a TA for any of those classes. So he is left alone with over 150 students that is under his responsibility. And so I've been asking him, what are the challenges, what are the struggles, what are the things that you actually really need help and support with? And I've been trying to build a tool that can be helpful for him, and also for myself, and then for anybody else who might need it. And as I was going through it, I realized, hey, there's an actual fun project out of this. Like, this is more than just a, something that I might be able to do for myself and a friend, but like, could I do something a little bit further with that? So what we're going to do today, we'll talk a little bit about what the problem, like the core of the problem really is. Then we'll talk briefly about what potential solutions are out there. Because I guarantee you that most of you here will be like, well, you should have used. And that is 100% something I'm interested in listening to because I like all of the options out there. But I did end up building my own thing using Cloudflare, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about the naming, why I decided to name this virtual TA Tiva. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards. And I'll show you guys a demo of it, and I can give you access if you would like. Um, I do have to caveat, big heavy caveat here. I broke a lot of stuff this morning, and I'm very disappointed in myself that I wasn't able to get them fixed. So the demo that you're going to see today is not the end result, not the MVP that I had finished last night, but like something I did, and I just, it's probably just like a semicolon in the wrong spot. I know it's something stupid, but this is what we've got. So here's the problem. Most people who are instructors or lecturers, and this includes everywhere from elementary school up, most people don't have a teaching assistant. They don't have any sort of assistance. They are solo in front of anywhere from 30 to 150 students, sometimes even thousands of students. Now, most of them don't have TAs. Now, we're in a research one institution, meaning we've got a lot of graduate students, meaning we've got a lot of people who can be paid to be TAs in free tuition vouchers. So here at the University of Illinois, it's not a very good representation of what it's like around the world because we have a lot of people who have TAs here. Most universities, most colleges don't have the same resources that we have here. And so they're struggling. These professors, these educators, are really struggling to try to help their student body. So this was the first part of my project, was just understanding what really is the problem here. So in my research, I've discovered that anywhere from two to eight hours of time is spent 
quote, preparing for a class period. So each class, and I'm going to be teaching, so this semester I teach for 16 weeks, and that's about 14 weeks worth of instruction with two classes each time, and we're talking anywhere from two to eight hours of preparation work needed for each of those 28 classes. So it's a lot of time. A lot of time invested doing what? Well, mostly preparing to teach, answering some student emails, actually teaching the class, there's that part, right? Then there's office hours and grading assignments. Now that's just a very short list of what actually goes into teaching a class. Who here is a professor or edu educator in some way? Yeah? Does that sound about right? Are we missing anything? No? Okay. Anybody else here teaching? All right, so for those of us who teach, like it's, this is about it, and good luck, right? And that's what the administrators say to you. They'll say, good luck. May the odds be ever in your favor. I really hope they don't rip your head off. And the students are very nice. Like, that's not their fault that class is so difficult, that so much time needs to go into each of these class periods. It's actually a systematic problem. It's a systemic thing that we actually need to, to work towards. And so the question then, in my mind, because of everything that I like to do in my day job, which I, I am... I work with artificial intelligence in pretty much everything that I'm doing. I was like, well, maybe I can use AI for this, right? How can I use AI? So before we go into that, let's look at a variation. Because looking down here, you've got grading assignments. And you've got kind of two tiers of TAs. One would be a grader, and one would be an actual teaching assistant. So a grader is going to focus mostly on just getting the grades. Right. You give them a rubric, you don't have to really tell them what's in the class, or they don't even have to attend the class periods themselves. And they're very more, uh, they're very little interaction directly with the students. They're just focused on being that assistant to help you process the grading. Now that seems like that would be an ideal space for AI to be able to jump in and support with that. And if you guys remember, those of you who were here last year, we had Vishal uh, Sakdev from the College of Business, and he came and he taught us about how he built a grader, a, a nice little virtual grader that he was using, and it was all through Discord, and it was really cool. But there's a little bit more that needs to happen if you want to have an actual virtual TA. That virtual TA needs to have understanding of the course. They need to have an understanding of the content. They do have a little more direct interaction with the students. They might have labs, they might have office hours, they might have an actual section that they teach or a subsection that they teach, one class per week or something like that. Um, I was involved, I was once a, a, a TA for a class. As an undergrad, I was this TA, and they had me teach one section every week. And so I had a subsection of the bigger classes, a very large class, and I would just teach a smaller section. And then that requires a little bit of training. That requires some knowledge and understanding of the class. So if the TA hasn't taken that class before, you expect that they will have taken similar classes and will have experience in similar spaces, enough to be able to be useful and helpful as a TA in that space. So as I was researching this, I went to the all wonderful Reddit because I, that's a great place to get people's opinions really quickly. And usually they're negative. But um, this was a post that actually was three years ago. It was a question like, how useful do you find your TAs? And most people, this was a student asking, like, I've been offered to become a TA. Should I consider it? How useful would it be for this teacher? And these were just, I cherry picked these ones. And obviously, they don't judge me for cherry picking my data. But like, you can tell we need TAs. Like, we love TAs. Even if they're difficult to work with, even if they don't have never taken the class before, any assistance is good assistance. So that's where I came up with this idea for, all right, now let's, we recognize that there needs to be assistance. What does that look like? So I could use one of four options. There's multiple options out there. I could go with AWS. There was a presentation last year, maybe it was earlier this year, the AWS came onto campus and they were teaching us all of the free access to the tools that they've given. And so I was like, okay, maybe I could go out there and use AWS. I could use Azure, and I, I was like, okay, Microsoft's got a pretty decent stack, and we've got free access, I've got free access to Microsoft Copilot, 
um, through the M365 and just everything through this high school, that's where I teach. I was like, maybe I could just do something like that. And I've seen people build some really quick, easy to build applications using Microsoft. But at the end of the day, I had this concern that, well, we'll, we'll go into that concern. I could also use UIUC.chat. Is anyone familiar with UIUC.chat? Has anyone seen that before? It's a really cool tool. If you haven't used it, use it. Like, check it out. It's a really easy way for you to just upload a whole ton of documents and build a chat off of that. Um, it's developed here at NCSA and just really cool. I would rec highly recommend UIUC chat. But it didn't get me everything that I needed because I had a couple of core requirements that I really wanted to make sure I could include in all of this. Ultimately, I decided on using Cloudflare mostly because I have a, an affiliate partnership with them, but also because I knew every part of their tech stack, every bit of what they offer allowed me to fit for, the, I could use their tools and their ecosystem for the problems that I wanted to solve. And I was like, at the end of the day, I really wanted to make it that anybody could use it. I wanted my friend at Manhattan College who doesn't have access to Canva, Canvas, sorry, like he doesn't have any sort of learning management system at all. I wanted it to be easy for him to be able to pick up this tool and actually put his stuff into it and use it, even if he didn't have Canvas, even if he didn't have Moodle, even if he didn't have any of those other tools that other people use. He's actually using an Excel document to maintain and manage all of his courses. And I was like, I can come up with a little something better than that. Um, and the vendors really don't like that, like AWS and Azure especially. They, it, it makes it a little harder for you to build something that you can just give out. You can open source stuff and there's other ways to do that, but that's why I decided on going with Cloudflare. So that's where we came up with Tiva. Teaching an Instructional Virtual Assistant. I like acronyms and I figured that would be fun. So, all right, how should this work? At the end of the day, I wanted it to be as simple as a student needs an interaction, they have a question, query, some sort of, I need something to happen. It should go to the course information, some sort of database that includes all of that course information, and then it should have a helpful response. This is a simple Q&A chatbot. And we can go through, like, if you want to, who here is familiar with Retrieval Augmented Generation RAG? Raise your hands if you've heard of it before. Okay, so Retrieval Augmented Generation is one way that people have used built systems like this before. What's interesting about RAG is that you go in, you get a query, this is a user question, and it goes and finds the relevant information. Usually that's based off of a vector search or a semantic search, right? And so you've got this database that's largely unstructured with the exception of it's got these indexes for each of the chunks of text. And those indexes are numerically valued, and they're in a, some, uh, uh, a vector space. And then this, the query, using fuzzy logic, gets converted into a vector space so that you can say, this question is most like this response, this text, these text chunks. And then it'll find those text chunks, and then it'll embed those text chunks into the prompt that then gets sent back to the large language model so that the large language model has context and can respond. But I didn't want to do it that way because I like to complicate things and also because I see this future where we need to get a little more accurate than just that. And so I wanted to actually use one of the best database structures out there, SQL. Like I wanted to make sure that this was like robust and fully organized, but the important part of this is that it can't just be chunks of text it actually has to be relevant chunks of text. So that's where I kind of came into this, this issue. Um, let me pause, any questions? I know I just like said a lot of things. No? Yeah? I'm still curious why you opt for SQL. Why did I opt for SQL? We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, um, I, I will dive deeper into SQL, or in SQL, just a little bit. Is that cool? All right, any other questions? Did you try RAG or did you yes. Before? Yeah, so I've, I've tried RAG before, and there is uh, another option. I mean, so yeah, I've tried RAG before. The interesting thing about RAG is that when you are looking at largely unstructured data and you're just chunking text bits, 
you might have, and you can have overlap in the rat, in the chunks and things like that, so you can not ignore everything, but you miss a lot of contextually valid information. And when you're using rag, you want to use what's called a top K, which is going to say here are the most, the closest number of bits of information, the chunks of information that are relevant here. And you kind of have to fine tune and play around with it and, and like fine tune the top K, fine tune whether, and we're, when I'm saying fine tune, I don't mean fine tuning language models, I'm just like, actually adjusting the numbers, uh, adjusting the heat, that sort of thing. So the temperature, sorry. So there, there is usefulness of RAG, but not exclusively. And going back to your question, why did I use SQL? It was the combination of both. That's really where the power came. That's, that's where I wanted I wanted it to be able to handle unstructured data, as well as I wanted it to be able to handle more structured data, which is what's found in the SQL database. So, does that answer you guys' question? More? Ish? Okay. So, a couple of features that I wanted to make sure were included in all of this. Number one, I wanted to make sure we're saving the chat history. That's easy to do. But I want to make sure that it's accessible for the students. Right? They can look back and see what types of questions do they have. I want to be able to access it so I can see what questions are my students having. If they're not paying attention during class, and they have a question of something that I know I clearly talked about, that tells me I did something wrong. If I get 15 students who are all asking the same question, something about my lecture was off. That way I can improve it for the next time. Or maybe the next class period I can come up and I can say, hey, this was something that I noticed a lot of you had questions about. Let's reiterate and talk over this, this concept again. I also wanted to have a unique session per user. So every time, and that's not a difficult problem to solve, but I just wanted to make sure that every time somebody came in, they had a unique experience that was just for them. And it remembered their previous sessions so that they wouldn't have to repeat a lot of the information. Hey, I'm still struggling with this problem. I can recall back the conversation. I would like it to be able to recall the previous conversation. What was it that you were struggling with? Remember last time we talked, we, we address these bullet points. What about this is still confusing? How can I help you a little bit further? Now we're getting into more instructional parts of this. It's not just a chat bot, but it's now going to be helping them as they're learning. The other thing I wanted to make sure that they had visually was timestamps on all their interactions. I wanted them to know when they were coming up with these ideas. And in the chat history, I want to be able to like, hey, you do your best work at this time. You come up with some pretty dumb questions at this time. It might be better to work on your homework at this time. So coming up with recommendations for the individual users on better times to work on their homework assignments, on better times to ask the questions when they're more fresh and they're aware. So that way, we can look at the timing and, and adjust appropriately. I also wanted it to be a simple UI, especially for the end users, the students especially. For me, it can be a little more complex, but for them, I want it to be as simple as just logging into a page and being able to do something simple. So those were my requirements. In the knowledge base, things that I want to make sure that I wanted were included in that knowledge base. I want to have the course structure. So what is going on every single class period? I want to have course materials. So if I'm showing a link to a video, I want to make sure that that link to the video is there, that the transcript from the video is there, that they can access either the video itself or just the transcript or the concepts coming from that. I also want a transcript of every class. So I'm going to be recording every single one of my classes and using another tool, using Whisper to like transcribe all of that and then upload those transcripts into this database so that they can say, hey, what did Brad talk about last week? And be able to come up with a bullet point list of the topics that I talked about last week. Because this is most of my students. This is most of all students, right? Especially around unofficial time. But like this, no, or finals week, or the weeks before finals, or during the weeks when everybody else is getting them in midterms, but you're not giving them a midterm, and they're like, I don't care what you're saying right now because I'm thinking about the midterm I have to take here in a couple of weeks, or in a couple of hours. They're not paying attention. Attention rates are really, really low. So I want those transcripts there so that they can recall and go back to it. Now, I do put, as a part of my grade, I do put that they must attend and they must participate. That kind of avoids the whole, I'm not paying too much attention in class, but at the same time, how much are they actually recalling? 
I also wanted the student interactions, like I said before, every single chat that they have with this, interact this, this tool. And then I also wanted to put in the student grades. Now this is an important one that's going to be very, needs to be secure. I want each student to be able to say, what's my grade in the class right now? One of my biggest pet peeves is getting that question from students. They go to Canvas and they'll say, hey, I see that I've got this grade. Can I get some extra credit? Because I want to get a better grade. I want to get an A plus in this class. I hate that. And my first re reflex to them is stop worrying so much about grades because I think the grades are an arbitrary depiction of, of your value, and I think people, when they falsely ascribe their own value to their grade point average, they say, actually, I'm worthless if I don't have the right grades. So I want them to be able to search for that, but I don't want that to be part of my interactions with them. I want to tell them that they're good because they're attending class, they're learning something valuable, they're actually doing something valuable with their life. Grades doesn't matter. Yeah? I have one question about the features. Do you think about the getting the feedback from the students on the answer by the team? I have put slides so you can look at Oh absolutely, that's a good point. I haven't put that in yet, but I should. Like just a like button. Okay. Was this helpful? Yes or no? Uh, that's an initial feedback that I can get. Also we can extract that from the questions that they're asking especially when they start getting frustrated and you can see it in the language, they're just like, this is not helpful, give me this, right? I would like, to, I want to see all of that. But I, I like that, a, a like button is a very easy thing to add. One more question. Yeah. Uh, one more feature to be added into this is some information which is real time, which you know is not part of the knowledge base, mm. uh, and interface with that before you send the probe to what do you mean by that? Uh, like in our corporate, we, uh, we, 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 we instrumented the same kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have real-time errors or real-time tickets, mm -hmm. then you get that information first along with the prompt yeah. before sending it to the ad mm -hmm. for the tickets. Oh, interesting, interesting. I have built into this, and it, you won't see it in the demo that I showed today, but there is this ability for me to enter in grades live, because most of, in my class especially, it's presentation based. So I can actually type up my comments and feedback for an individual student's, uh, their presentation. I really liked this, this is the grade that you got in that moment, and it gets vectorized and put into the SQL database and put straight into there so they can just, hey, what did I get on that? at the end of class, or during class if they really wanted to. They're like, it immediately gets uploaded in that one. So we do have that real-time information ability. Um, I don't think there are any instances of like tickets or, or errors or, or things like that. But I like the idea of adding in the real-time information, and, and that's something that I've added into this. So let's go to the demo. Hopefully it breaks. It will. Guarantee you. This is a very simplistic UI. I am working with Twilio to get it set up so that they can actually chat with like text back and forth with their chat with the chatbot, but that's not very good for me, so we'll get there eventually. Um, and also just so you know, this doesn't have single sign-on, doesn't have any login information, so you won't have the ability to like the students won't be able to get access to their grades with this example here. And there will be that login information that's required there. And so, you know, building a chatbot is nothing special. But building a chatbot that can access the information, okay, it will. So that's, that's really where the interesting part was. And I would love everybody's advice and suggestions on ways to improve this. Like I said, it's that combination of SQL and combination of RAG that I, and vector queries that I really wanted to bridge the gap for. So the way that I built this is actually each query, there's one language model that translates that into a SQL query. And so it goes and searches the database to find relevant information from SQL. But it's also using, at the same time, simultaneously, it's using fuzzy logic to generate a, a vector type of search, so a semantic search, saying find all of the information that is relevant here. So I'm looking, using both of those and asking, 
do those bits of information that I found from semantic search and the bits of information I found from SQL query, do they match? Am I missing anything? Bridging those both together and then using retrieval augmented generation to generate that, those answers there. So I'm really using both of those simultaneously. Um, and we're probably going to, it's probably going to show how broken it is right now. been told, and I'll just kind of throw that one out there, is if I can have one tool for all of my classes. So I can actually manage all of my course load in one tool. I can't do that unless the professor gives me permission, but that's one idea. What are, yeah? Sorry. Um, I think something, I'm trying to think of what that would be, but I think something that you can do is like, uh, I have a question, but I don't know if I can ask it that does it have the answers to it. So maybe like you could have like example questions that oh, could yeah. get specific to that subject so you can get started somewhere. Yeah, I can I can put Yeah, I I've, I've, I've done that before in the, in the puzzle last. I think I've shown you those. Have I shown you those ones where we just had boxes of the example queries like these are the most commonly asked questions. I would like to use it, the actual most commonly asked questions, like actually put in there, this is what your peers are asking. That way you don't feel stupid when you also have that same question, like that's okay. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't added that in, that's a good idea. Do you have something that prevents the student from just taking the question from the assignment and asking it here, and then it's just gonna give the answer? So real today would, yeah. wouldn't answer it. Yeah, yeah. How do you deal with that? Um, I don't give any assignments that are that easily answered. So I, I, I fundamentally believe that AI should be used in everybody's classes. And if your assessments are something that a chatbot can pass, then you're using the wrong assessments. That's, that's at the core of what I believe. And so I think that, so all of these assignments that I've given them, that data exploration, they're going to write a proposal outlining this, but they're going to present it. And they're actually going to present that in class. You can't fake that. You can't use AI to fake that. Even if AI helped you generate it, which is totally fine, you still have to do that presentation. Now, not every class can do that, right? Some classes do have, you got to sit down and you just got to write it out, write out the code, or whatever that might be. So I can't speak for everyone else's classes. Mine is just very fluffy. And so the presentation allows itself to be more easily, like less easily cheatable, if that makes sense. But it's a good point. I mean, What's to prevent the AI from just giving the answers? And the answer is nothing. Unless you decide to put in some guardrails in, in the prompt itself and say, don't answer any questions related to this. You can do that, but that's, that's really the only thing. Like, this is the upcoming assignment. Don't give them answers related to this. But be helpful in this way. Like, it becomes a, a rather complex circle. So, you might want to just say, hey, don't help them with anything related to assignments. Then you can do that. Does anyone have any suggestions on other ways that you can put guardrails up like that? Uh, you first, and then. So there are two things here that I wanted to point out. Uh, not, not the software part of it, 
but now when I think of taking a class in the graduate school, I want to know what the class is going to be about and I don't want to read about it. I want to get like a two minute quick clip on what this is going to be. So, so initially what's going to happen is I'm going to take a class next week and I don't know if I want to drop that class or not. <laughs> so I want to get like a preview, like a playlist yeah. of things and I want to ask this God. Like, give me a playlist of all the classes that are going to happen in the next 16 weeks. Depending on that, I'll just like, okay, I like class 16, I like class 5, yeah. I will take it. Yeah. So, I want that. It's because now I don't know what am I going to learn. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good <laughs> and point. And reading about it is not giving me the feel. So when I saw it, I was like, okay, this guy is interesting, I would like to do <laughs> But if I would have read a book, I, and I did up read about the class, yeah. they just were telling, I didn't like <laughs> it. I was not, I'm not going to take it. But now oh, when I met you, yeah. I did it well, it's an under. Mine is the undergrad, not not the mm -hmm. grad level one. Yeah, but there is a data storytelling class in graduate. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Thank you. Uh, the thing I like about those suggestions. So there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, there are a couple of tools already out there doing this sort of thing, but you could just use a text to voice, and you could generate a voice version of you know the the compelling spiel, like write a compelling class description and then use that. Or you can use videos from your class. You know, a highlight reel of the, the videos yeah. of the class. If you've ever looked at edX, all of the courses online for free, uh, they like to do that. They'll have the preview, two minute preview of the class. This is what you're gonna get from this. I'm taking an intro to CS uh, class from Harvard right now, just because I thought it would be fun. And uh, it is. It's, boring, but it's, it's fun. Uh, no, actually, he makes it very engaging, but their, their highlight reel is just like, it's like production level movie type of thing. Like there's a soundtrack that sounds like it might be Hans Zimmer, and I'm like, okay, this is interesting. So I like this idea of how can I make the class a little more appealing. At the same time, some professors are like, I don't struggle to get enough students to fill my class. In fact, I don't want more people wanting to come to my class because that means it's more work for me. So it's this fine balance, right? How do we get a tool that can help me handle hundreds of students, potentially, while at the same time being appealing to uh, what can I produce that's appealing to the students? I saw a demonstration in AI product recently, and they had fed you know, sort of a gated amount of information in and answering questions from it. And then at the bottom of it was a link to the source doc. Yeah. So where did this information come from? So I could see that being useful for them. If you have materials for the course, you know, okay, answer this question. If you really want to dig in, if you have to read, um, you know, go click on this link and you can see the actual assignment document. That's where SQL is, is more helpful because I can have the links to the source documents in the table, right? It's just right there. Anytime I'm pulling information from this, make sure that I'm contributing it to the source. So I've been doing a similar project like this, but for a website that's the, a large wiki page, or a large wiki for an organization. They've got a, a decent size library. It's about 14,000 documents. And it's, it's pretty robust. A lot of videos, a lot of audio, a lot of text. And you think about how do I find the right sources for a very specific question? That is a really hard problem to solve. Now, not everyone knows SQL. And so you can't just give people the right SQL query to find the information that you need. And so you have to find this right balance of being able to use natural language to ask questions but at the same time, finding the relevant information from among a massive database. So that's, that's a real problem. But that's where the SQL comes in, is being able to, to cite your sources. Now you can do that with RAG as well. And you can just have a key value pair, where it's saying like this chunk comes from this source. You can do that just as easily. But again, it's looking at the chunk of data, and it's not looking at the broader scope of where that chunk fits in larger things. Yeah. So, uh, this yeah, so I, I just have one question. How are you integrating SQL with, say, uh, natural language processing? Like, are you using some specific uh, intermediary language, uh, like 
uh, how is it, uh, how does it work, like how do you, uh, because uh, some, uh, as you said, there might be millions of records from the database, right? So, how do you optimize the whole thing and convert it into a point, uh, sometimes it might take one second, two frames, that kind of, in that time frame, how do you okay, achieve that? It's not an easy thing and I still haven't solved it entirely. So the delay, the latency is extremely problematic here. I mean, you, you ask a really complex question and it can take a decent chunk of time, right? Sometimes several seconds. And another one that we've built, is it, is that? Is, can you all hear that? So, solving that problem is, is rather complex, but one way, one workaround that I've been using lately is that you can actually have a key value pair of SQL queries with natural language questions. So if the question is similar enough to this type of question, use a similar enough SQL query in this space. You can also have a mapping of all of the tables and the fields that you've got in your SQL database so that when you've got queries, you know that it's generating the right SQL code for it. But it is what's called in Cloudflare a worker that has to do this processing. And it's async, so it's all happening at the same time, but it still takes a little bit of time. So you're actually processing the query, natural language query, using an LLM to generate SQL code, looking at and referring to that key value pair database of natural language questions to SQL queries, and then generating the right and appropriate SQL query from that to then search the SQL database in D1 and then generate all of the relevant information. Then taking that information, embedding that into the prompt, and then natural language coming up with the response. It sounds very complex, but it's all relatively fast. In, in terms of, like relatively speaking. But that's another reason why, and you'll notice this on here, the, the hardest part, or the longest part, is once it starts generating the text, it's actually like, the gap between question and starting to generate the text is relatively small. But you can, and you can, it's just when it starts typing, that's the problem. So like, I type in hello again, and you'll see how it's generating the response. And that one's relatively quick, but if I were to do the query, then it would have a little bit longer before it generates the response. So you have to give the end user something that helps them realize that it's not just that they're not being ignored. Like, give them something to wait on. Like, so that they know that work is happening right now. So you talked about like wait time and stuff. Uh, so I'm a student and uh, typically I like to kind of crash test like ChatGPT and like Google Gemini, just as yeah. a joke. Yeah. And uh, I know sometimes uh, ChatGPT would completely give up after a bit or if I ask too many questions and like, I don't have an answer. Yeah. So how do I know that won't happen with this, you know? Well, I don't use ChatGPT. I don't use OpenAI at all. I like to avoid them if at all possible. Um, just for personal reasons, I, I, that's that's beyond the scope of this discussion today. But uh, so I use Meta's Llama three, uh, their instruct model for all of this. But every question, so what's what's happening? In addition, I don't think I've said this yet, but every question, natural language question, is actually going to receive its own. It's going to ve be vectorized as well. So I'm actually going to be indexing the question so that I can then use that in the RAG model to be able to search for relevant chunks of text at the same time. It's all happening simultaneously, right? And so that one I use Cloudflare's base model for indexing and for, for vectorizing. So it's a combination of those two, but I could play around with any of those models if I really wanted to. The only problem is I would have to re-vectorize all of the information if I'm using a model that's not compatible with the current vector database that I've built. So an output will always be given at the end of the day? Yeah, okay. should be. But wait time just varies? Wait time varies. Okay. But now, 
if there's something that's not in the database, like they ask a question that's not information that's not found in the database, it won't hallucinate. It won't say, hey, I think that it's actually, or just give you a completely, utterly wrong uh, situation. So I've built that into it as well to make sure that it's not hallucinating. I can't guarantee it won't hallucinate. Because all language models hallucinate. Like every single language model is going to hallucinate at the end of the day. The question is how many guardrails can you put in place to ensure that it hallucinates less frequently. Um, so if there's no information in the database, it will say, I don't know. And I've given that as a part of the prompt. Just say, just say I don't know. So it will come back with like a, hey, I don't have anything, if that's not in the database. And that's like a draw line between like a real TA and like... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, hopefully a real TA would say, I don't know. But... <laughs> <laughs> How, how often does that actually happen? They might just be like, I have to be impressive, let me make it up on the spot. The teachers do the same thing, by the way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Thanks, Mary. Um, I was wondering, how anonymous is this? Do the students, I mean, I know you're gonna be able to see the questions, but do you know who has actually asked the question? And that may change um, how forthcoming they are to ask the question, or maybe not to look. Ignorant. And the next thing, I have kind of two questions here. Um, can you set the timing for availability of materials in course? Mm. Because sometimes I want somebody to learn something maybe a rudimentary way, and then there's a more advanced way later, but I, I don't want you to skip that that uh, stair-step process to learn. Absolutely. So the first part of that, answering the, the, the anonymity question, I can build an anonymous sub object. So what I use inside of Cloudflare, it's called durable objects. And so durable objects essentially allows for you to spin up a new unique instance for every unique user. And you can create a login for each of those unique users so that they're coming into their own durable object and maintain state through that um, relevant information is put into their own SQL table. So that it's just relevant for that individual and then the queries can only access like my individual user account can only access query, can only access my individual grade information. So you don't have the cross contamination of like, it's not one table with everyone's grades in it. It's an individual table for every single student, which is easy for me to do, but also you just have to make sure that you set up the table schema in the right way. So that's allowable. And then in order for students to ask anonymous questions, I hadn't thought about that one yet, but I was thinking maybe I could just create a new durable object that's just for anonymous questions. Like if you don't want to be known, you can just go to this one and it won't say who you are. It'll log the questions, but it won't say who actually asked the question. That's totally doable. It's a good suggestion. The second one, um, remind me what the second one was. Um, if you could uh, change the, the timing of when assignments and materials oh, yeah, are yeah. available for them to see and uh, Absolutely. So like I said, where can I put the thing? Like I said, I, I've set it up so that I can do, add in real-time information. And that real-time information the real-time information, the transcripts from every class. So I have a very small summary of the topic that's going to be addressed during the classes coming up. And it won't be until after the class that I actually upload the transcript from that class. So they won't be able to ask questions of the materials that are going to be happening in three weeks, other than that simple statement of what we're going to talk about. Um, I haven't thought too deeply into that space, but that's my current thinking. Like I don't want the materials to be accessible until after we've actually talked about that. Because I don't want them thinking about different data visualization techniques and how much I hate pie charts when we're still just talking about, like, I don't know, how to sell an idea, right? Totally different topics, not relevant to the, what they're doing right now. Yeah. You know, in terms of, what do you anticipate in terms of student acceptance and comfort with this? I recall at one point in time, uh, a professor at a smaller college used statistics to predict the, how people were going to do, grading two answers, didn't grade the rest, gave up four, 
you know, it was a long time ago. Uh, the student attitudes change, you know, and uh, what do you anticipate student acceptance would be? And then I guess the second point is, you know, how do you, what are you thinking about when this uh, gives the wrong answer? Mm -hmm. I have no clue how students are going to accept this. I put into my syllabus that they do not have to use it, and it will not impact their grade regardless. Um, the one thing I did put in there in the syllabus is that if you use this and you rely solely on the output in order to make your own decisions, and then you get a bad grade, it's not the it's not the Tiva's fault. It's your fault. So I did have to put that caveat in the syllabus that I'm going to be giving to each of the students to just like clarify, hey, this is a, a fun little toy. I want to see, do you use this? Is it helpful? Is it helpful for you? Is it helpful for me? If you don't use it, that's a great learning. Like then I have to ask the question like, why didn't they use it? And what could potentially be different if I wanted them to use it, right? Maybe there's just no market for that. Maybe just students today just don't like it. Maybe it's a bad user interface. Maybe it's whatever that might be. Um, and then the second question you asked. Um, you know, your, your, uh, your, your chatbot says the assignment's due tomorrow, but in fact it was <coughs> due today at noon and they missed the deadline. Uh, whatever it is. Yeah, that's that's the one where I say don't rely solely on Tiva just because of the potential for hallucinations, right? Now, I do I do hard code that into the SQL database of like the deadlines and all that stuff, but at the end of the day they still use Canvas. Right? I'm still using Canvas and they still have to access it and they still will see when the grades like that all happens through Canvas at the same time. I do have that backup. But I think if I wanted to build something more robust and actually like implementable that I could replace Canvas with, I'd have to figure out a way to do that. That does lead me to um, some things that I wanted to do in the future here. But just so you know what this can currently do, they can chat with the syllabus, all the upcoming assignments, grade program, upcoming, upcoming class topics. They can chat with the course materials as I add the class transcripts that will be all added in there. That will be RAG not SQL because it's just text chunks, right? It's just going to be chunking up the text from a, a, a single class. But I'm also using another tool that it, I've been using for a while. It's called Soar Scribe. And you can actually, uh, that just extracts meaningful topics from all of that, which I could build my own, but I don't want to have to pay for it. Um, uh, and then saving each user session, unique session, we can do that. But coming soon is this idea for instructors, right? I want to be able to give people uh, reviewing individual and holistic student grades and performance. Like, I want to see how everyone's doing at the same time, like doing a simple query of like, hey, how did everybody do on the last assignment? Or you know, who's been showing up too late to class? Who are the students that seem like they might need some help? Some help? Then there's some other questions related to being able to grade live. Um, like you had mentioned, uh, Sorry, you, you had mentioned it, like asking the in, in vivo how can I just upload information in the moment. Or you were asking that, I think that's, that's right. Um, I can just add that information. That's, that's soon to come, I haven't turned it on. And then user authentication with their net ID, and then having students being able to review their previous grades, accessing their grades, previous chats, that sort of thing. So yeah, what other questions do you guys have? We've got seven minutes, yeah. Oh, you did? Good. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. Can you screenshot that and send it to me? Actually, I just quickly did a question. And you said that it should see that I can move on. Yeah. Do you mean the answer that they were? It hallucinated? All right. There's an error processing your request. That's a different one. It didn't hallucinate. Uh, can you send that, like, like, screenshot that and send that to Brad at semiosis-ai.com? Yeah. I have to admit, every time I see a chat about like that, I think it's Zord. <laughs> and I want to put in, you know, into the dark cave and look around. <laughs> into the dark cave and look around. Pick up Zord. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I. 
I need to know your input uh, from the point of view because this this altogether idea is very intriguing. But uh, like for example, if any exams or midterm comes, we prepare everything holistically that okay, this topic is there and this is coming in our exam and everything. But a uh, student who want to go into depth of learning that okay, you provide a reference of a book as well. That there is a book and you can go and refer this book for the topic which is there. Uh, so if anything comes up, instead of like immediate office hour to wait for like Monday that okay, office hour will be there. If I say that okay, this question is there and I am struggling to understand and if the chatbot can refer to the book and say that okay, yeah. uh, this is exactly the topic which is being and you can read this. Or so I, I don't expect chatbot to answer that question, but at least a reference point of view from the topic, so that students can be very easily be uh, redirected, and this will help them kind of. I want your like ideation on this. That okay, what your input will be on this part? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's an interesting point. Um, how much do we want the chatbot to be instructional versus informational? Meaning, how much of it is do we want it to be teaching, and how much do we trust it to do that teaching, versus just pointing to the resources that we know are valid and, and useful? I think it depends on the class. It depends on what the topic is. There are some topics that are very easily LLMable, if you want to use a coin a new herb. But like AI could just do a really good job, especially a robust model like like GPT-40 or a Llama 3 or a Gemini. Even. Like there there are some out there that are really good. The open source models keep getting better. But I think that's up to the that's up to the professor. Right up to the instructor. Do I care enough about this? If a student wants to learn more, maybe I just point them to a series of YouTube videos. Maybe I point them to a series of TED Talks or a book or a blog article or whatever that might be, or a Harvard Business Review article. Like it really depends on the topic. I think you are using the way it's it. I think you are using the traditional database. Did you look at the graph database that can help I, Yeah, I've got a friend who lives in Seattle, and he is all about the graph databases. I am too, I love it. But unfortunately, Cloudflare doesn't handle graph databases all that well. So it has to do with an external graph database, something like a Neo4j or something like that. I'm very open to it. I haven't yet, I haven't yet built anything into that, because I just wanted to use the Cloudflare ecosystem to start with, see how far I could get. But yes, graph, graph database is like, just so you all know, if you're wondering, should I do a RAG application or a SQL application or a combination of that, graph database. Like, just use a graph. Like, gra knowledge graphs are, are so much more powerful and robust than all of this. And I think that's the future. People are gonna come up, have to come up with like a, maybe it's a gag, a graph augmented generation, I don't know. But something like that. I, yeah, that's a good signature. Well, thank you all very much for your time today. Enjoy the week. Enjoy your Friday. Take off. Go enjoy the weekend. And thank you for being here. Thank you.